If you have your Bibles, turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. Matthew chapter 6. Today I want to talk to you on the subject of do not worry. I thought about asking those that tend to worry to raise their hands. But I didn't want to start out on the wrong foot. Because there would be some people not telling the truth and keep their hands down. And I don't have any statistics for this, but in my heart of hearts, I believe anywhere from 80 to 85% of people worry about something. Okay? And you, you may disagree, but when I looked at our writing and listened to Jesus carefully this week in the Scripture that we see, obviously it was a problem back in His days. And here's what I'm finding out, and I know, and I know, and I know, folks. The same things that were being dealt with in Jesus' day are the same things we are dealing with also. Sin is sin, folks, and I want to get it over with, okay? Worrying is a sin according to the Word of God. No amens on that? I know I'm going to step on some toes but folks, I'm just the messenger boy, okay? We are doing uh, topical sermons right now. Uh, I didn't want to start a series in the middle of summer, uh, so uh, I will be teaching a part of the James. I'll be teaching James in our Sunday nights in July. I'll start back on Sunday nights in July and August uh, there. And uh, then in August, I will start teaching uh, the book of Matthew uh, verse by verse. So I want you to see the outline first today. Do not worry. Number one, be totally committed to God. And folks, you can be worry-free. I want to say it again. You can be worry-free, but it's a choice. All of life is a choice. Nobody makes you worry. And I've heard many a people say, well, my mom worried all the time, or my dad worried all the time, or I just got the worry gene. I don't think there is one, okay? We justify all kinds of things, and even people say, I don't worry, I'm just deeply concerned about things. <laughs> See, we spiritualize things too when we're guilty of it. All right, and so here I want, to, I want you to see three things that you need to do to be worried free. Number one, be totally committed to God. And folks, our text is Jesus speaking. Jesus does not make any mistakes. Jesus just doesn't throw sentences out there to get people's attention. It's obvious, it's an obvious problem that we have and they had back then. Number two, believe that God is in control. Believe that God is in control. And number three, replace worry with trust. Replace worry with trust. Let me give you a definition or a few definitions here of worry. It's being anxious. It's being stressed. It's having mental anguish. And here's what a lot of people do. It's overthinking things. You overthink. You think something's going to happen and the last statistic I read, 75% of the things we worry about never come true. So you're wasting your time. And you're wasting God's time. It's kind of like a rocking chair. I love rocking chairs on front porches. And you can be rocking and rocking and rocking, but you are going nowhere. Okay? You're just in motion. And listen to things that, that uh, uh, stress or worry, worrying can do. It can cause lack of sleep. It can cause high blood pressure. It can cause stomach issues. It can cause headaches or migraines. It can cause poor decisions. And it can cause unnecessary stress in your life. And I know there are some folks, folks, and they're, they're kind of few, that they're just calm all the time. Okay, you just, you can't rattle them, you can't, and I thank God for those kind of people because those help us who worry. So we have to understand Jesus is, is addressing this issue in uh, Matthew chapter 6. You know, in our text, Jesus is continuing to teach on the Sermon on the Mount, 
essential point is his teaching that as Christians, we need to trust God in all situations of life. Jesus is Lord, Master, Savior, and Provider. His love, His presence, and the Holy Spirit is more than enough to get us through challenging times like these. So let's look at what Jesus had to say. Matthew chapter 6, verse 24. No one can serve two masters. What does no one mean? You are not the exception to the rule. No one can serve two masters. It's like trying to walk in two different directions. It doesn't happen, okay? No one can serve two masters, for either he will hate the one and love the other, or else he'll be loyal to one and despise the other. And we know what he is talking about. He's talking about a master and a slave issue. And in Roman times, there were well over a million slaves in the Roman Empire at its peak. And this is what Jesus, he was trying to give an example, a life of example of what he was talking about. The master totally controlled the slave. And I think it's interesting that Paul, the apostle, called himself several times in the epistles a bond slave to Jesus Christ. So we see the, the point in what he is saying. You have to make a choice. You have to make a choice. And folks, I believe when we get saved, we are totally committed to God. Now, we may not know everything, and we may not know all the doctrine, all right? It doesn't matter if you can't find a, a, a book when you start. When I say go to Zephaniah and you can't find that, okay? That's okay. You will grow in the Lord. But it's saying in salvation, I make Jesus Lord of my life. And Lord means master. So we don't need two masters in our lives. We need one master, and that is God Almighty himself. He is our master. Jesus is our example, and the Holy Spirit helps us to know how to live. And he's saying and comparing, there's a big difference between hate and love. If you hate one thing, uh, you know, I, I, I think of something that I hate. My mom and dad loved liver and onions. And when mom started cooking that, I was looking for a house to go to. Amen. They made the mistake one time of making me eat it in front of company. And it did not turn out well. <laughs> Why? Just the smell. And folks, there are some things that we hate. We just, we don't like it, all right? We don't like it. But we also love other things. Oh, man, there's a lot of things I love. All right? Catfish. Mm -hmm. Oh, I love it. What is he saying? Folks, it's either hate or love. We are either following God. Now, look at the second part here. You cannot serve God in mammon. What is he talking about? He's talking about the world. Some people interpret that as money. But it's not just money, folks. It's the world system and the world values. Folks, the world is trying to tell us how to live. The world is trying to tell us how to act. The world is shoving things down our throat. Satan has an agenda. The news has an agenda. There is sin among us, and they want to talk about the new normal. It's not normal what they are asking us to do. It's an abomination unto God, some of these things. And we do not need to buy into the world's philosophy. We don't. We need to live for Christ. I don't have to tell you what they are. You should know as a Christian these things. They're parading it everywhere. They want to legalize everything that is against God's holy word. So the Bible tells us in Joshua 24, Joshua 24, go there. Joshua 24, verse 14, 
This is Old Testament. This is Joshua. Now therefore, fear the Lord. Respect God. Folks, there's not a holy respect for God anymore. All I hear is people taking God's name in vain in the world. Respect God, fear God, serve Him in sincerity and in truth. Put away the gods your father served on the other side of the river and in Egypt. Folks, they were serving gods way back in the Old Testament time, and people are still serving gods. Little g, look at this, serve the Lord. If you are totally committed to God, you're serving the Lord. You wake up thinking about Him. You pray You witness. You try to please him in everything that you do. And if it seems evil evil to you to serve the Lord, choose for yourself this day whom you will serve. And folks, we all have a choice. You made a choice today. Am I getting up and I going to church? You know what? You know what helps me? And I never have to set an alarm, folks. My alarm goes off between 5.30 and 6 in my head every day. But if I'll lay my clothes out, If I'm looking forward to going, the choice has already been made. Choose to serve God. And it's not with this 50%. God's not looking for part-time servants. He's looking for folks that love Him, that serve Him, that look forward to, to talking to Him and reading His Word. Whether... The gods of your father served that were on the other side of the river, the gods of the Amorites, in whom land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Oh, folks, Joshua had to take Moses' place. Can you imagine following Moses? But yet, he picked up Moses' mantle, and he set before probably 2,000 Israelites, serve the Lord. Be committed to him. The author Luke, Luke the doctor, Luke 14, he had some words on serving God. Luke 14, and you talk about straight, he, again, this is Jesus' words, it's in red. <clears throat> if anyone comes to me and does not hate his father, his mother, his wife, his children, his sisters, and his own life. Brother Mike, am I supposed to hate my mom? No, that's not what he said. Am I supposed to hate my sisters? Well, there was some times in my life. (laughs) And I gave them more trouble, I promise you, than they gave me. That's not what he's saying. He's saying that God needs to be number one in your life. Nothing gets in that place. Nothing takes the place of God. There's no other priority it's like when people used to come and, and relatives would live on, uh, visit us on the weekends. I've heard my dad say it more than once. Sunday morning, we're going to church, and he gave them the time. If you want to come with us, you come with us. If you want to stay here, you stay here. That's the way I was raised, and that's what he is saying. God needs to be number one in your life. Number one. Verse 27, and, who it does, and whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. What did Jesus throw in? Hey, it's going to be hard. There's going to be hard times. There's going to be crosses that we have to bear. Keep serving. Keep walking. Keep loving. Keep praying when the bad times come. In verse 33, so likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has, cannot be my disciple. Oh, folks, it's 100% in. I know in sports, our coaches, you know, used to say all in. And they would even go further. They'd say, when you're out there playing ball, I need 110% out of you. Well, folks, God is saying the same thing to us. Don't let anything come before God. Don't let anything come before God. Acts 20, the Apostle Paul in Acts. Acts 20, and he is speaking uh, to the elders, the Ephesian elders, and he had gone back through places that he had been. Look at verse 22. 
and see how now I go bound in the Spirit to Jerusalem, not knowing the things that will happen to me there, except the Holy Spirit testifies in every city saying that change and tribulation awaits me. You know what most Christians would have done? They'd have went somewhere else. What is he saying? I'm going to be arrested. I'm going to jail. But none of these things move me, nor do I count my life dear to myself, so that I may finish my race with joy in the ministry which I receive from the Lord to testify to the gospel of the grace of God. You know what worry does? Worry takes your joy away. Satan wants to get in your head. Satan wants to make you think what's right is what. What's right is right and wrong. I mean, he's totally opposite. If it's right, he wants you to think it's wrong. Satan steals our joy. And when we worry about things, our joy is stolen. So we must understand, we must understand, we need to be totally committed to God. The first commandment, thou shalt not have any other gods before us. Folks, the world is pulling on us. The world is trying to tell us what we need to do and what we need to be and what we need to accept and what we need to reject. Folks, Christians follow Jesus. Christians are committed to God. Christians are committed to God's holy word. And if you want to be uh, worry-free, and you think about it, you say, how is that being worry-free? The decisions have already been made. You have to ask yourself one question, and it's not hard, folks. What would Jesus do? What would he do? And you, I know this is battle. The battle goes on, but I'm telling you, folks, we can win. If we make Jesus Lord of our life, if we love God with all our heart, our soul, our minds, our strength, and our bodies, we can make the right decision every day. Time. Number two. Two is believe that God is in control. You know what amazes me? We believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And we believe that he was born of a virgin. <laughs> There's a lot of folks. There's a lot of the world that doesn't believe that. We believe that he lived a perfect life. If you're saved, you need to believe that. We believe that he was crucified on the cross and he rose from the dead. But we can't trust him with our daily lives? You hear what I'm saying? Folks, he's not abandoning you. He's either testing you or trying to make you stronger. And some of us don't pass the test, folks. Why? Worry, 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 worry. We're up at night. We're walking the floor. We're popping pills. We're doing everything we can to try to get some rest. Oh, folks, I am telling you, you must believe that God is in control. Look at Matthew, verse 25, Matthew 6, 25. Matthew 6, 25. Therefore, I say to you, do not worry about your life. Six times in the Scripture that I'm reading, it says either do not worry or has the word worry in it. Remember, if Jesus just said it twice, it was important. But obviously, this was a problem in that day. And I am telling you, as a minister of the gospel, this is a problem today. We're living, we're living defeated lives. We are. We don't have that abundant joy and that abundant life. Why? Because we worry too much. And folks, there are situations in our lives that we cannot change. We can't change it. That wayward child, you can't change them. You just have to trust the Bible that says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is older, he'll come back to you. That's my paraphrase. And folks, I have experienced that in my own life. I've experienced that in Jonathan's life. It works. God's Word works, folks. And that's what he is saying. Look what it says. Do not worry about your life or what you will eat or what you will drink 
or about body or what you will put on. Is life not more than food and the body more than clothing? I'll never forget a bumper sticker that I saw. And I, I'm telling you, the first time I saw it, I nearly fell out of my truck laughing. Eat right, exercise, die anyway. <laughs> I kid you not, and I'm not going to name a name, but there was a guy in Alma. He was about 45 years old. The dude was a runner. He kind of looked like Phil. He was that skinny. All right. Phil has to jump around in the shower to get wet. If, if, you know, I mean, he is so skinny. And I admire him walking. I really do feel I admire what you That takes discipline. Okay. But I'm simply saying he, at the age, I believe, 47 years old, died of a heart attack. And again, I'm not telling you to eat like your preacher does, <laughs> okay? I am not. I'm simply saying there's things in our lives that we have no control over, and we need to trust God in all situations in life. I preached last week on the prodigal son. Perfect example. Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor they uh, reap nor gather into barns. Yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more value uh, than they are? Which of you, by worrying, can add one cubit to his stature? Can I, can I answer that for you? I think you're smart enough to know. Nobody, nobody. All right, you are the way God made you. Matter of fact, Psalms 139 says you were beautifully made. You were wonderfully made. He made you just like he wanted you. Quit worrying about stuff. Quit worrying about what other people think of you. You're not standing before other people, folks. They may judge you here on this earth, but the only one you have to stand before is God, and that is a promise from God's Word. Quit worrying. They may not even be talking about you, and you're worried about something that never even happened. Folks, I mean, I, we went over 700 in re enrollment in our church. We have what, more than 700 members on roll. Do you think for one minute I can control 700 people? Do you think for one minute all 700 people like me? Now, I, I find that hard to believe that somebody <laughs> doesn't like me. I know I can't please everyone, but I don't have to. As long as I am preaching the Word of God, pleasing God, walking with God, challenging you in the Word of God, then I just want to hear my Savior say, well, good. Well done, my good and faithful servant. Folks, quit trying to impress others. We impress others spending money that we don't have. Did you hear, oh, so and so got a new car? Honey, we need a new car. I hope you're smarter than that. I hope you're not that. Let me carefully excuse my. We, let's just go on. Okay. <laughs> I couldn't find the word. I promise you, I couldn't find it. Verse 28. So, why do you worry about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field, how they grow, and they neither toil nor spin. Yet I say to you, even Solomon, all of his glory, was not arrayed in one of one like these. What's he talking about? Folks, he's simply saying, if you look out, and we had the wettest spring that we've had in a long time, and man, you look across the fields, and you see flowers, and you look in uh, backyards, and you see roses, and you th see all these things. And you see birds of the air, okay? He speaks about that too. If God cares for flowers and cares for birds, I promise you, He cares about you. And we just have to, man, we all go through storms in life. We all go through times when you, we feel like there's a drought, a spiritual drought in our life. Man, you got to push through it. You don't quit going to church. 
That's what, I, that's what amazes me about some people. They get in a jam and they get hurt and they don't even go to church. Folks, we need to go to church to get encouraged, to get challenged, to, to exercise our spiritual muscles. So that when Satan attacks us, we're going to say, hey, devil, I know it's you. You're the one talking. Shut your mouth. God didn't say that. Folks, Satan is a liar. He is a liar. Verse 30, now if God so clothes the grass of the field which is today and tomorrow is thrown into the oven, will he not m much more clothe you? Look at this word. Oh, ye of little faith. Can I remind Peter of Peter? Okay. I'll never deny Christ. I'm the one that got out of the boat. And why did he sink? Because he took his eyes off of Jesus. Folks, you can't do it on your own. Some of you are trying. You really are trying on your own. And you're frustrated. You worry. You fret. You don't have the peace of God in your life. It's not about of trying, folks. It's about trusting. Trusting God. Therefore, do not worry. What shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For after these things the Gentile seek. What is he saying? Man, the Gentiles was the world back then. He's saying don't act like the world. Act like a born-again Christian that has victory in Jesus. How you doing? Oh, I'm okay. How you doing? Oh, my boat sunk way back. I was waiting for my ship to come in. It sank last week. <laughs> well, have you ever thought that maybe God wants to give you a new ship? A bigger ship? Folks, trust God. For your Heavenly Father knows that you need all these things. Hebrews 11.1, 1, you know this, you know this, but I'm going to read it anyway. Hebrews 11, 1, now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. I have never seen God in person. I have never heard an audible voice, but I know who God is, and I know when he speaks to me. How do I do it? I do it by faith, by faith, trusting in God. Look at verse 6, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. Some of you are trying, man, you're working at it. You're working at it. You're tired. You're tired. You're weary. You can't do it by yourself. Trust God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. That he is what? Oh, folks, that he is everything. Every answer to every problem in life is found in the Word of God. And in the Spirit of God, seek God with all your heart. Philippians, Philippians 4. Man, I love this scripture here. Philippians 4. Philippians 4. Well, I got it marked here. There we go. Philippians 4, verse 10. But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again. Paul had gone through a hard time. Paul couldn't meet all his bills. Paul couldn't do all the things that he wanted to do. What did he keep doing? He just kept trusting God. Though you, are, though you, sure, you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in regard, uh, uh, in re where am I at? Okay, not that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. Folks, can you answer that? Every state that you're in, can you be content? You know what contentment is? No worries. No worries. My God's coming through. My God's coming through. I'm waiting on the Lord. And folks, we hate that four-letter word, W A. I T. We don't like to wait on the Lord. And let me tell you something. Let me give you a hint here. The reason you're waiting still is because you don't like to wait. Folks, God's not Santa Claus. You can't just 
pray a prayer and expect God to deliver it that day. Sometimes he does, but we have to wait on the Lord. I know how to be abased and I know how to abound. Paul's saying, I've been on both sides. I've been poor, I've been rich. Everywhere in all things, I have learned both to be full and to be hungry and to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthened me. Paul said there were days, man, you look at 2 Corinthians, or maybe 1 Corinthians 12, in the list of things Paul went through, shipwreck, stone, left for dead, he goes through the list, and he basically says, none of these things move me. I'm going to serve God no matter what is happening in my life. I'm serving God. And here's the key. I can do all things. This is what we say. We emphasize the wrong word in this scripture. I, I is what we say. You can't do all things. There's some things I can't do, folks. All right. You are not going to see me in a ballerina contest. You know, I am not, it ain't going to happen. All right. I am, I have no rhythm and I'm as clumsy as I can be. I can do all things. Here's the word. If you write in your Bible, circle the word through. This is the key. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Folks, we need to emphasize the right thing. And we're running out of time. Isaiah 43. Ah, we're going to go there anyway. Isaiah 43. I was going to skip that one, but it's good. Isaiah 43. But now thus saith the Lord who created you, O Jacob, and he who formed you, Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. Folks, we're children of God. We're children of God. And when you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned. Nor shall the flame scorch you. Folks, we know, we know the Hebrew children. Perfect example, for I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. Believe that God is in control. And also, folks, believe in God's timing. That's the key. We are in a I want it now society. Man, you can get a hot cup of coffee in about 90 seconds. You can get popcorn in about three and a half minutes. Instant, instant, instant. We call our restaurants fast food. We're used to that. But folks, God is not, uh, you know, he's not obligated in your time. Wait on the Lord. The last thing, replace worry with trust. Rela replace worry with trust. Matthew 6. Let me get there again. I love this. But seek ye first the kingdom of God in his righteousness. Folks, we have to know the right priorities. We have to have the right priorities. But seek first what? The kingdom of God. Scott, I know you know this, but we could be having a bad day, maybe at work or wherever, but yet we run into somebody somewhere after work we present the gospel to them and they get saved. What just went away? That bad day. That bad day. Why? Because God allowed us to share the gospel of Christ with somebody and somebody gets saved. Folks, the Bible says all of the angels in heaven are rejoicing when somebody gets saved. Make Jesus a prior priority in your life. Invite people to church. Share the gospel with somebody. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient is the day in its own trouble. And folks, we have to realize, we have to realize and we have to trust God's timing in all that we do. He has told us six times in this scripture to quit worrying. Proverbs 3. Proverbs 3, and I know you know this, but we're going we're gonna to look at it anyway. Proverbs 3, I love this. 
Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not into your own understanding. Church, there's a lot of things I don't understand. There's a lot of things going on in this world that just blows my mind. But I still have to trust. I still have to believe. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he shall direct your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. Psalms 23, you know that when you, you read that sometime, and I want to close with this. Philippians chapter 4. Philippians 4. Back in the book of Philippians. Philippians 4, verse 6. Be anxious for nothing. Don't worry. Quit worrying. But in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known unto God. I do feel like sometimes I have had cancer in my past. I'd had two incisions and two skin grafts. And, you know, I'm not saying this is always the case, but many times uh, the cancer comes back. But I'm telling you folks, God will be in control. And as long as I can walk up these steps, and as long as I can preach the Word of God, I am not going to let it get me down if that's what God chooses. Folks, I am going to trust God with thanksgiving. Let your requests be known to God. And here it is. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Jesus Christ. You want to get the peace of God in your life? Quit worrying. Quit worrying. Quit worrying. Folks, I'm going to ask you to do something that I've never asked you to do. And I want to hope you understand this, this is a prayer altar down here. Okay? And I know you can do this where you are, but I believe it will help some of, some of you if during our invitation time, that thing that you are worrying about, you come down and you get on your knees. If you can, you can sit on the front rows. But you give that worry to God. And you tell Him, I'm not taking it back. You realize even in the Old Testament, some of the slaughtered animals weren't dead. And sometimes those animals could try to get off the altar. And here, here's what Satan is telling you right now. You can't do it. You've made this decision before. You can't do it. You can't do it. My Bible says you can. Leave it at the altar and go back to your seat saying, God, I'm leaving it right there. I'm giving it to you. Father, thank you for this day. God, I thank you that we can have victory in Jesus. God, my heart breaks over people that worry so much. And God, I pray, Lord, that we, by faith, will just trust you. Trust in your timing. Trust in your will. Trust in your way. Trust in your word. Trust you with all of our heart, our soul, our mind, our strength, and our bodies. God, please take this worry away. God, I pray that the Holy Spirit would just be going through this uh, congregation right now. And God, I know there's heavy hearts. I know there's people who are hurting. And God, I pray that they would just come down. Just It won't take long at all. Just come down. Kneel at the altar. Give it to you and walk away. And Lord, if there's those here that don't know you, that don't know you, God, I pray that they would seek you. God, we want to share the gospel with them. We want them to know what salvation is. We want them to know that you can change your lives totally. Today could be the first day of the rest of their lives. So God, I pray if there's one here that doesn't know you, they would be saved. Others that need to come for baptism or even join the church, God, I pray they would do what you've asked them to do. 
So God, we give you this invitation. It is yours. This is your church. God, help us to be totally honest with you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Would you stand to your feet? If God has told you to come, you just come to this altar right now. Just come.